Well, it is finally here. We've been talking about it for weeks. We've been planning it for months. We've been praying about it for even longer than that. And it's finally here. Our, our ministry year theme, Fully Alive. This, this idea actually started more than a year ago. Before our family even came to Mount Pleasant, as we were still praying about possibilities, uh, Bobby and I had lunch at Rosalie's. That's always a good place for lunch. Some people eat salad. Salads are good. I'd suggest a side of cheesesteak. Um, yeah. <laughs> Bobby and I sat down together and we were talking about and dreaming about possibilities. And, and he asked the question of what I thought about uniting the church together around a single theme. Well, I love the idea. Uh, but it occurred to me as last fall arrived that I'd been here about, well, a few weeks, and several of them I was on vacation. I, I was still learning the congregation, so we weren't ready last fall to jump into a unified theme yet. So, so Bobby took the kids to the edge, and, uh, and I preached through the Gospel of Luke, because you can't go wrong preaching Jesus. And that was last year, but this year is different. This year is going to be different. We've been walking together now for a little over a year. We've seen God doing things among us that only God can do. Healing some old wounds. Breathing new life. Restoring our story. And I'm excited about the future that God has for us as His people together. In fact, I am convinced that the the future that God has for Mount Pleasant Church is greater than any story of our past. And I am so blessed to be able to take this journey with you as we follow Jesus together. Well, let me explain how we settled on this theme, Fully Alive. Now, we started with the reason why Mount Pleasant Church exists, which is what? If you need a hint, it's right in front of you. It's also in your note sheet. By the way, you're going to want to pull your note sheet out right now because there are blanks on your note sheet. And I know that if I give you blanks on your note sheet and you don't get those blanks filled in, you're going to have to call someone this afternoon, uh, some hotline somewhere. So uh, you're going to want to pull those out now. Yeah, we started with this question of why, why does Mount Pleasant Church exist? Well, we exist to make disciples who make a difference. You see... We're not about our facilities, although God's given us beautiful facilities. And we're going to get bathrooms too soon. But don't let Dale know, shh, I promised Dale I'd save his thunder for him. So he's going to give an update in a couple of weeks. Pretend like I didn't say anything, all right? All right. Uh, we've got great facilities. But our facilities are just a resource, a resource for doing what we're really trying to do together. We've got great programs, particularly in children and youth ministries. But our programs aren't why we exist. We don't exist to run great programs, even though we do. And, and you know, we don't exist to have great worship services. Although, for the life of me, I can't imagine why anyone would rather be anywhere else on a Sunday morning than in this room. God's blessed us with amazing musician, technical talent, kids, a whole family together, and, and worship in here is alive and dynamic. I love it. There are Sundays that I, there are Sundays that I stand here and sit here, and, and, and there's just tears running down my, my face because I can't believe I get to be here with you. But worship services isn't why we exist. They're just a tool. Everything, our facilities, our program, our staff, our worship service, they're all a means to an end. They're all there to help us make disciples who make a difference. Of course, the question then becomes, what's that? <laughs> what's a disciple who makes a difference? How do I know if I am a disciple who's making a difference? How do we know if we're succeeding in making disciples who make a difference? I'll tell you that for most of my life, the answer that I would have given, that, given to that question is, well, there are certain things that you have to do, 
I almost said doo-doo, but you don't want to say that publicly. <laughs> Janet is just offended right now. Uh, <laughs> there's things that you do, and there's things you don't do, right? There's these two different lists. You got to do all the stuff on this side, and you can't do any of the stuff on this side. So, so a disciple, well, that's easy. You go to church, and you live your life as a good religious person. Most of my life, that's how I would have answered the question. But over the last, well, any number of years now, I decided that instead of listening to what I always thought, instead of listening to whatever I've ever been told, it might be a good idea to go to God's Word and ask God what He thinks about the subject. I know, that's a crazy idea, isn't it? And, and what I've been discovering over the last several years, when it comes to defining a disciple, a disciple who makes a difference is far more about who we are than it is about what we know or what we do. By the way, if you're one of those blank in filler inners, now's your moment. Being a disciple who makes a difference is much more about who we are than it is about what we know or what we do. Think about how Jesus made disciples. When Jesus met someone, he said, he did not say, oh, you want to be my disciple? Great, let me escort you to a Sunday school class. No, that's not what Jesus did. When people said, Jesus, I want to be your disciple, Jesus did not say, okay, great, here's a whole moral code. Do all of these things, and you'll be okay. No. When people came to Jesus and wanted to be a disciple, he simply issued an invitation. An invitation into relationship. And it's within the context of that relationship that lives are changed from the inside out. You know, nothing's changed. The same is true today. We don't define disciples by what we do. We define disciples as who we are. Jesus invites us into a relationship, one that changes us from the inside out. Now, at the beginning of this calendar year, I preached a series of sermons called Disciple Life that that dug in a little more to this idea of of what does it mean to be a disciple who makes a difference. And don't worry, I'm not going to put anybody on the spot to talk about the three dynamics of a disciple who makes a difference, although it also is staring you in the face. Let me, let me remind you, a disciple of Jesus, a disciple who makes a difference is someone who is spiritually alive in Christ, who's relationally connected with one another, and who's missionally engaged in their neighborhoods and among the nations. Now, if you missed this series, or if you'd just like a refresher, you can head to our website, underneath the sermons tab. You can go back and you can watch these sermons again. And in fact, you can download them and take them with you if you like, whatever works best for you. But that's, that was our starting point. That's how, that's how we got started in defining this theme fully alive. And, and because I'm just a little bit of a one-trick pony, I said, well, let's pray. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty much my answer to almost any question that comes up in church. Let's pray. If somebody has a problem, let's pray. If somebody has a question, uh, let's pray. Um, so that's what we did. As a staff, we started intentionally praying together. Our governance board intentionally praying together. I simply asked the question, what, what is God calling us to emphasize in this next ministry year? It's amazing. It's not surprising, but it's amazing the way unanimous consent came along very quickly. Whether it was our staff or whether it was our governance board, we all agreed that that the thing we need to start with is being spiritually alive in Christ, emphasizing our relationship with God through Jesus Christ. And we phrased it being fully alive and faithfully committed to Christ. Now, we could have picked any number of passages of Scripture. We settled on one, Colossians 2, verse 13, because in one verse you get both the problem and the solution. But, but hang in with me there. Uh, if, you, uh, 
If you enjoyed the reading plan from, the, from Stories with Luke, I want you to know your note sheet still has a reading plan. On the back side of your note sheet, you'll see your reading plan this week. And what I've done is given you five different passages of Scripture that we thought about and prayed about as we were deciding on our theme verse. So all of these passages will, uh, will take you to this idea of being fully alive and faithfully committed to Christ. I encourage you to, to read through those. If you're new to Mount Pleasant and you're wondering who, who does the math around here, there's only five readings. Um, I did the math and here's why it's short. It's because we know life gets busy and I get frustrated if I get behind of a plan. So I only give you five readings because we wanted to build in grace. If you want a seven-day plan, read the passage that I preached on on that sixth day and then pick any one of those six to read on the seventh and you'll be good to go. All right. Um, also, for those of you who are new to Mount Pleasant, there's a Let's Talk box there on the back side of your note sheet. That's there every week as a resource for you to continue the conversation in your homes and in your discipling communities. We, wanna, we want us to extend the conversation beyond this room so that we can continue to engage in, in talking about God and His ways together. So, whether it's in your, at your family table or in your own personal devotions, I want to encourage you to use that box. One other thing, uh, there's the Go Social post. This week it's on the front side of your page. And each week there's one of those Go Social posts because we want to enable you to make a difference in your online communities as well. And so you can go to the church's Facebook page or, or a Twitter feed or to my own Instagram page and you can just re-like and tweet and retweet and... All those things that Bobby knows about, right? Bobby is, by the way, if you don't follow Bobby on Twitter, you should. He posts a lot of really good stuff on his Twitter feed. So just, to, just want to encourage you there. Well, let me take you back to, to why we picked the passage that we picked. I told you that we picked this passage and, uh, because it gives us both the problem and the solution in one simple package. So let's start with the problem. Here's what God's Word says. You were dead because of your sins and because your sinful nature was not yet cut away. So what's the problem? We were what? Dead. Yeah. Yeah, we're dead. You see, all of us have sinned. We've, we've violated the sinless perfection of God's holiness. And according to God's word, the wages of sin is not difficulty, and it's not disease, and it's not disappointment. The wages of sin isn't a harder life. The wages of sin isn't some kind of spiritual sickness that if, you know, if we take, if we take two scripture verses and call me in the morning, suddenly we're going to be okay. And the problem isn't that we've disappointed somebody, not even God. No, that's not the problem. God's Word says that the wages of sin is death, and that we're born that way. That's what the Bible means when the Bible talks about our sin nature. We're born with a sin condition. All of us that are parents know that you don't ever have to teach your kids to sin, right? Right? It comes naturally. We're naturally born sinners. The Bible refers to that as our sin nature. And we all have it. We all have this problem. There's not a single one of us who is righteous. Not me. Not you. Not even Janet. And if Janet isn't, what chance do the rest of us have, right? The best person you have ever known is a sinner. The best person who's ever lived is sinful. And the wages of that sin is death. So the problem isn't that we're spiritually sick. The problem is we're dead. Now, religion will tell us that the solution to the problem is doing things. Read your Bible every day. Pray even more than that. Go to church every time the doors are open. Be a good religious person. That's what religion will tell us is the answer to the problem. 
But again, the problem isn't that we're sick. The problems were dead. And dead men do no deeds. Right? There's only one thing a dead thing can do. Stink. Right? That's it. Well, decompose and stink. That's all a dead person can do. So we can try to do all of the good stuff we want to try. It will do no good. It will make no difference. Because it doesn't address the fundamental problem of our deadness. That's why, that's why religion is so incredibly frustrating. It's a treadmill that you never get off. No matter how long you're on that thing, and no matter how fast you try to run on that thing, you don't get anywhere. Nowhere but frustrated. Thankfully, this is just half of our theme verse, because that would be a thoroughly depressing thing to focus on all year. Let's get to the other half. Let's get to the good news of this. Here's the solution. Then God made you alive with Christ, for he forgave all our sins. See, the Bible tells us that when we were dead in our sin, God loved us enough to send his one and only son, Jesus, into this world. And God did not send Jesus into this world to condemn us. That would have been a really good amen point. You know, let let me try it again. You ready this time? All right. God did not send Jesus into the world to condemn us. Amen. That's so important for us to understand because the common thought that I find in so many people is God being this angry parent, terribly disappointed in us, and looking for any opportunity to whack us and teach us a lesson the hard way. I I don't know where that idea comes from. It doesn't come from here. This isn't the picture that God's Word paints of who God is. Said God's word paints a much better picture. God's word tells us that God so loves us, even when we're in our sin, even when we are stinking sinners, God loves us so much, he sent his son Jesus into this world, not to condemn us, but to save us. And whoever believes in his son Jesus does not perish, but receives what? Everlasting life. Yeah, we've known John 3.16 since we're young kids. That is the love of God. A love that saves. Jesus is the sinless Son of God who gave himself in our place. We deserve death. We earned it. Some of us more than others. Jesus never sinned. That's why he could pay the price for ours. His death on the cross, the blood he shed on the cross, paid the price for all of our sin. His resurrection has defeated death forever. And his return to heaven guarantees us the hope of a glorious future someday and an abundant life between now and then. This is God's gift of grace to us. And when we receive God's gift of grace in childlike faith, the Bible tells us that our sin is forgiven and that our nature is transformed from sinful to sinless. The Bible tells us that when we place our faith in Christ's finished work at Calvary, that the very same power that raised Jesus from the dead enters our life in the presence and power of the Holy Spirit, and begins its transforming work in us, changing us from the inside out. As a result, we are made fully alive with Christ. For God forgave all of our sin. And that takes us to our Go Social post for today. So I invite you to read this along with me. Pay attention to the pronouns. Here we go. God made me alive with Christ, for he forgave all my sins. Do you see those pronouns? Do you see the difference? Do you feel the difference that that makes? Let's say that again together. God made me alive with Christ, 
for he forgave all my sins. Hmm. This is our starting point. This is our foundation. This is the goal. We become fully alive in Christ, not by being good religious people, but by saying yes to a relationship with God that changes us from the inside out. And we remain fully alive in Christ and faithfully committed to Christ, not by doing stuff, but by walking with Jesus in relationship, a relationship that changes us from the inside out. And more than anything else this ministry year, we want all of us to know together what it is to be fully alive in Christ and faithfully committed to Christ. And that starts by placing our faith in Christ. Many of us have done that a long time ago. But it could be that there's some folks here today that have never heard this story of God's gift of grace before. Or maybe you've heard it before, but it seemed too good to be true, and and you've been running the rat race of religion, trying to be good enough, knowing that you, you never make it. But you sense the Holy Spirit calling you into relationship this morning. And maybe, maybe you're not exactly sure how, how that happens or, or how to say that. Well, on the back of your note sheet, there's a prayer. These are not magic words. But if these words represent the cry of your heart, I invite you to use them to talk with God right now. And as our musicians come to the stage, I'm going to read through this prayer out loud. If God's calling you to place your faith in Christ today, I invite you to make this your prayer silently before the Lord. Dear God, I know I'm a sinner, and I ask for your forgiveness. I believe Jesus Christ is your Son. I believe He died for my sin and that you raised Him to life. I want to trust Him as my Savior and follow Him as my Lord from this day forward. Guide my life and help me to do your will. I pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. I want you to know that if that's the prayer of your heart today, everything just changed. You have been transformed, not because you said a prayer, but because of what Jesus has done for you. And we would love to talk with you about that. So whether it's after the service today, or whether you give us a holler through the week, shoot us an email, a text, however, however we can connect with you, we would love to talk with you, and we'd love to help you take your first few steps in relationship with Christ. My friend, it's all because of Jesus we're alive. Amen? Amen? It's all because the blood of Jesus Christ has covered our sin and raised us to life. It's all because of Jesus that we are alive. Thanks be to God.